Welcome to the Noob Square Podcast. Today it's a uh, it's an unusual episode. It's a topical conversation with Devin O'Day, the California Chapter Director of BHA, and uh, he's also a Stella Spira from San Diego. Um, he's very well versed in current sort of regulatory struggles over there um, that affect the sort of the spearfishing world. And we've also got Finn and Forages Eric Keener on the line as well. We discuss all sorts of stuff. We start off talking about BHA, which is Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, which is uh, the voice for our wild public lands, waters and wildlife, uh, particularly in the US. This, this organization is doing awesome things, really puts a connection between hunting and spearfishing, which I quite like. And uh, I think there's lots of commonalities and lots of awesome things represented in both lifestyles. I think we share a lot of commonalities. So we start the discussion sort of talking about that. We get into some wild, a wild poo story, one of the wildest I've heard on the show. Um, but we... We also get some crappy internet as well. I'm hoping the audio comes out really well. As usual, the uh, the legends that edit this podcast, Brandon and Pat, do an absolute bang up job, and so hopefully they can rescue it for us. We also talk about the 99 Spiro Recipes book, um, as well as uh, Catch and Cook Comp in California. There, uh, it's running at the end of April. So listen in because there's a bunch of awesome stuff happening in and around this competition, including a public beach cleanup, as well as an urchin culling event. Um, and we also get in down and dirty. We talk about sustainability. We talk about spear versus land-based hunting culture. We talk about 30-30. There's a, a whole heap of conversation in here that you might enjoy. By the time this episode goes live, I also have a bit of secret news. I don't normally share from my pri- private life, but before just – just before this episode goes live, I am eloping with the love of my life, Crystal, uh, in a very small wedding. And um, so, hey, uh, that's a little bit from my private life. But hey, let's get into this episode with Eric and Devin. Here we go. Adreno.com.au, the home of recipes, blogs, videos, equipment reviews, and an obnoxiously large range of spearfishing equipment for frothers like you. Not only that, but spearfishing trips and courses courses and trips that I sometimes get to go on. Check them out at adreno.com.au. It's a Spiro's best friend. Check them out. And if you want to buy gear, pump in the code NoobSpiro to save $20 on every purchase over $200. You can use that online, in-store. Use the code NoobSpiro, save some cash, and support the NoobSpiro podcast. Shop with adreno.com.au. Neptonics.com source the very best in spearing gear from around the planet. Jerry says, if we sell it, we believe in it. We trust it and dive it. Neptonics is the one-stop shop for all your spearfishing essentials. Neptonics is solid gear that works, and you'll know it's true when you pull the trigger on a Neptonics mech. On every snap of a Neptonics power band and in every whiz of a Neptonics spear gun reel, singing with the power of another big fish. Buy gear you can depend on at neptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10%. All right, g'day, Noob Sparrow community. Today I'm joined by two men with beer in hand, absolutely prepared for the podcast of our lives. I hope you guys enjoy it today. We've got a backcountry hunters and anglers, California chapter president. Have I got it right? I've, I've, I've probably made a, a mess of it. It's Devin O'Day. Thank, welcome to the show, Devin. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Yeah, California chapter coordinator, president. Yeah, it's always, you know, maybe one day we can work on that, but <laughs> it's always a mouthful. I'm looking Close for, enough. I'm looking forward to finding out a bit more about him. And also, welcome back to the show. We've got Eric Keener from Finn and Forage. And uh, these two gentlemen have come to join me today to chat about a number of initiatives. So, welcome, Eric. Hey, man. Thanks a lot. Glad to be back. All right, cool. So, as I mentioned, beer in hand, beverage of choice today, gentlemen. What is your beverage of choice? Well, I've just uh, I just took down like four rolls of sushi with my family, and uh, and now I'm gonna wash it down with a new uh, lime and juniper pills from Einstock. Sounds it sounds quite snobby and hipster. Definitely a Californian, <laughs> a, South, a Southern <laughs> Californian too. <laughs> Devin, what have you got, mate? Mine's accidentally snobby and hipster as well. So it was you know. St. Paddy's uh, last week, and I uh, am an, I'm Irish, so of course I went out and bought some Guinness. But when I got home, I found out it was not Guinness; it was Nitro Cold Brew Coffee Guinness. Um, wow! So that was a surprise, and um, yeah, so we may be doing this podcast, and I may be up for another eight hours. But um, I'm, re- I'm ready for the adventure. Here we go. You guys have taken me way out of my comfort zone with your beer 
choices. I'm, I feel like an amateur. In Queensland here, we have terrible beer, 4X, and uh, my taste runs slightly more sophisticated than that, but not nearly as as much as your gentleman's. Well, it's it's noon where you're at, so it's way past five here. What are you drinking? <laughs> I got a water with a vitamin pill. That's about it today. It's pretty lame. <laughs> All good. Well, um, so, Devin, I know nothing about back, backcountry hunters and anglers or BHA, um, but I have had a bit of a look around, and I see you guys have been around for quite a while, and it's a serious deal what you guys do, and it's, it's a, it seems like a massive benefit to not only the hunting community but Spiros as well. So can you just give me a quick rundown on, on, on what it is and what your background is with it? Yeah, I'd love to. So BHA founded in 2003 around a campfire in Oregon, and uh, the original impetus was to be the voice for the silent wilderness. And, um, you know, since then, we have we now have chapters in 48 states, two Canadian provinces, and one territory. Um, so really a, a North American organization. Um, and we, we advocate on behalf of wild public lands, waters, and wildlife. And, uh, you know, our work really centers around the, just the North American tradition of hunting and fishing in a natural setting. And, um, you know, we, we do, we work on the policy side of things, um, you know, pretty, pretty intricately and, um, throughout all of our chapters, both, you know, on the federal policy and, and state policy and, and policies that would, you know, affect all of North America. But we also, uh, we do stewardship projects, uh, and, and that's really what kind of sets us apart. I think from a lot of organizations is that, um, we are, uh, characteristically very young. We're, we're the, you know, one of the fastest growing conservation organizations and, um, our membership is very diverse, very young. And we're spread out, you know, kind of politically, we're basically like one third independent, one third Republican, one third Democrat. So we have, you know, we're, we're very much bipartisan. Um, and we seek to have that, um, that approach in everything that we do and that, uh, you know, our, we're, we're, we're sticking up for, for wildlife, for conservation, for access and opportunity on public lands and waters. And, um, and it's a grassroots thing. So, you know, our, our chapters are incredible. They're just driven by, um, the energy and enthusiasm of, of hunters, anglers, Spiros, everyone that, you know, enjoys the the craft and the pursuit. And they like, uh, they want to be involved and make sure that that's going to be sustainable for their kids and generations down the line. I love the North American, like the hunting conservation mindset, whereby you know a lot of the hunting dollars that are spent in the community, in the you know in the sport and the pursuit of animals, goes back into various conservation initiatives. Obviously, I'm assuming backcountry hunters and anglers is is, is one part of that. That 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 um, that paradigm, though, if you like, or that that idea is not as prevalent around the world as it possibly is in North America. That, that sort of where we're seen as synonymous, like being a hunter and a conservationist are seen as sort of the same thing. I think where you guys are with that, is that fair? And, 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 and how do you see, do you see that as evolving that idea and being spread? Is it becoming more prevalent? That's a great question. I, I did just gather a couple of the latest figures because I thought that that might be something that came up so I can speak to that. Just adding a little bit of additional context, that American system of conservation funding, um, you know, it's, which is, you know, where the user pays and there's public benefits and that structure, um, mm. that sportsmen and women prov- are, you know, they do provide the bulk of funding for, for state fish and wildlife agencies that are tasked with managing our wildlife resources. And so, you know, through that system, 13.4 billion as revenue has been collected um, and that's through the 1937 Pittman Robertson Act. And another 10.5 billion has been collected through the 1950 Dingle Johnson Act. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, there, there really is a tremendous amount that has been collected. And it's not just, you know, licenses and tag sales. It's it, it really goes and extends into a lot of aspects of society, you know, through the excise taxes, firearms and ammunition, and um, a lot of boating equipment, fishing equipment. And there's a lot of different industries that pay into that system that are utilizing that, you know, the, the benefit from the, the shared use of resources. And so I, I think there's a huge amount of support for it. And, and really folks are, are happy to know that that's where their, their dollars are going when they're, when they're paying for, you know, a new fishing rod or whatever it might be. 
At the risk of preaching to the choir here, Devin, like I think the idea of hunting and or, you know, land base or in the ocean, I think, you know, it precludes us to this, this, you know, like I just don't think you can help but develop an awareness of the ecosystems you're involved with and some of those conservation mindsets and the ideas. and um, But that's not apparent to someone who is not from our world. How do you go about communicating and helping people to understand that? It's the food, man. It's, uh, it's what brings us all together as people. Uh, you know, like I, I didn't come from a family of, of hunters or anglers, to be honest. I came from a family uh, that, that no, nobody was, uh, was into that. And I, I don't know how I got into fishing, really. It must have been through an uncle or something. But, you know, I've been fishing <laughs> from an early age and, and got into hunting about, you know, a little over a decade ago. But it, it's one of those things where, you know, I, I was able to convince, you know, my mom that hunting was, was a valuable, uh, pursuit, but you know, when I brought home some venison for the first time, because when I told her about the idea of, you know, Hey, I want to hunt and, you know, it was not, it was not something that she was really excited about hearing, (laughs) but, but after bringing home some venison and, and having a conversation about you know, Hey, it took me four years to kill this deer, like four years of, <laughs> of being unsuccessful with my bow out on the, in the woods and practicing and, you know, all the toils and tribulations that came from that. That was like, you know, like I worked my ass off for this deer and like, it means a lot to me and I want to share it with you. And then, you know, she like, well, wow. Understanding your perspective. And then, Hey, this is pretty good. Like, you know, if you want to bring some more, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say no. And those deer eating my azalea, I sure wish you could shoot one of those. And I'm like, well, <laughs> we live in suburbia. So unfortunately that's not going to happen, but. <laughs> which part of, uh, which part of, I'm assuming you grew up in California. I did. Yeah. I was born on the East coast, but I primarily grew up in California, uh, in the Bay area. So I, I grew up in, uh, on the edge of Marin and Sonoma County, um, in a town called Novato. And then, um, that's where my mom still lives up there and I'm down in San Diego now. So what you had like whitetail ranging through your, your your sort of your street the back the back the back end of your property or something? Uh, blacktail. They just walked down blacktail. the sidewalk. Um, oh well. They yeah they um there there's no predators really except for mountain lions for the most part it's maybe coyote and a the occasional car so um, there's no hunting really anywhere around there and a lot of the public land in the Bay Area uh, hunting is not allowed and so it's real. it's, I mean, the deer population is, is very robust and especially in suburbia where, you know, uh, a big mountain lion is less likely to track them into suburbia. So that's where you end up seeing just every day. Yeah. You'll there. I mean, they're literally walking down the sidewalk, eating people's gardens. It's, it's kind of, I mean, sometimes you'll be walking and it's like, they don't even want to get out of the way. It's like, uh, wow. excuse me, like, uh, pardon me there. You know, don't mind me just coming through. I've I've only ever really experienced that in Japan. Um, I mean, but I haven't been to the US, but like it is a surreal thing when you see wild deer and they come right up to you and nudge you. They want food and stuff, and because even on a farm, deer are pretty like cagey around human beings. Um, like farm deer, where they are farming them for velvet and stuff. Um, so that that would be a very unusual experience for me. And uh, I guess the tourists that come there must geek out on it a lot. Oh yeah, man. I mean, it's, it's not the, it's not the norm either. It, it happens, but I mean, they're still usually pretty cagey, but it, I mean, yeah, there's plenty of. That's, that's not the case in, in Pacific Grove where we're at. They run rampant everywhere. Huge bucks just sitting like in your front yard. You can't have gardens <laughs> unless they're super protected. I literally oh, no. just, uh, I just messaged both of you guys a video that my wife took this morning of like nine of them just walking across our porch. <laughs> Far out. All right. Oh, good. Well, Devin, I want to dig into your story a bit more in a sec, but I, I kind of wanted Eric to introduce himself as um, Finn and Forage because it may be a while since um, Noob Spirit listeners have, have heard about Finn and Forage. And then I want to hear the story of how you two connected and um, and what that sort of culminated in. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, Finn and Forage started out as something very different than what it is now. Originally, the idea was uh, pre-shutdown and everything and uh, – before, before the world kind of changed a lot. Um, and we wanted to be educational based. We wanted to be events based. We wanted to do a lot of like coastal foraging and teaching people about food and 
typically catering to newer divers without bias and without frustration or arrogance, just really being a helpful part of the community, putting out helpful content and stuff like that. And I was blown away when, um, when we started putting the word out, like, Hey, this is an idea we want to do. And all of a sudden we have like a Forbes science writer. And then we have this environmental scientist. And then one of the chefs, uh, chef judges, that judged the very first catch and cook I put on in 2019, um, I hit him up and he's, he's a guy that was trained by the master chef who also trained Thomas Keller of the French laundry, which is one of the, you know, huge restaurant Michelin star restaurants on the West coast. And so he's a top, top, top notch chef. And I was just like out of the blue hail Mary was like, Hey, this is an idea. We'd love food to be the focus of spearfishing. Do you think you'd want to, help us out with some stuff. And he loved the idea and he's a huge contributor to the team. Um, so the idea was like, we were originally just going to get all of these professionals. We had Joe Platko, who's just a world renowned underwater photographer. Um, surprisingly, I don't, I don't know why they all said yes. There was no money involved. It was just a passion project. And, and then everything shut down and we kind of had to change our gears. And, and what that's led to two years later now is, um, We've been working with a lot of brands to promote the message of ocean conservation and care for the environment and trying to make sure we're being as sustainable as possible. And uh, one of our, we'll get into the catch and cook later because that's our most exciting project right now. But um, one of our teammates, Ryan Gentry, was getting pretty involved and taking the lead on the conservation side, you know, getting our hands or feet wet a conservationist or an activist or get involved in ways that most people don't. And Ryan connected with Devin and then he's now, I forget his title, but he's like Central California coordinator or something like that. So he's he's gotten pretty deeply involved with BHA. And the more we do work together and projects together, um, it, the more apparent it is that these guys are such an awesome, unbiased resource. The way that they navigate difficult topics, the way that um, cause you know, I, I think in my opinion, when, you, when I hear conservation, I automatically go like PETA yeah. and I don't, cause my Instagram has a lot of like half, you know, half processed fish and it looks a little gory at times, but I feel like I get a lot of kind of, uh, you hear conservation, you're like, Oh, you want to shut down spearfishing and access to places. And, um, what's great about Devin is that's, that's not the case. They come from a very rational point of view where they're heavily weighing the data on both sides. They're not just pulling opinions out of the thin air and then running with them. Um, so we, we rely on them heavily to make sure that our messaging is on point and that, you know, we're getting involved in the areas that we need to get involved in. And we do, geez, we do so much behind the scenes with regulatory agencies and the department of fish and wildlife and way beyond the stuff you're seeing with food on Instagram and, and videos and stuff like that. So Fin and Forage has really kind of found its stride and um, and we're happy to call BHA a, a long-term partner. Cool, cool. Awesome. So Ryan, is he the host of the Fin and Forage podcast? Yeah, he and I originally were going to tag team it. And then I was really good at networking with people, but I have a three-year-old. And at the time he didn't have a child <laughs> now. And so I was like, Ryan, you got to help me with this one, man. We got this awesome guy. Can you just talk to him? And yeah. so he was doing it. And then the, the goal is still for, for both of us to do it, but we'll kind of see where that goes in the future. It's a hard one making it all work. Um, so I think I listened to a podcast. Was that Devin and Ryan talking about some of these things like the 3030 initiative that you got? Um, this, this sort of under a lot of rigorous attention, I guess, at the moment. Yeah, that that was kind of one of the impetus of, you know, Ryan and I connecting in the beginning was some of the conversations happening around 30 by 30 and, and so we did, yeah, we, we had a chat about that on the podcast and, you know, and, and since that point, um, as you know, Eric mentioned, uh, Ryan's gotten more involved and, and he helps with some of our central coast policies. He's like our central coast policy lead. And we kind of carve up the state in different regions and try to be a, you know, a conduit of source for that grassroots engagement, um, uh, you know, for passionate sportsmen and women under the umbrella and, 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 you know, walking that sometimes it's a tightrope of, of, you know, advocacy and, and conservation while maintaining access and opportunity, 100%. And, you know, all these things, there's so much nuance involved And 30 by 30 is like the perfect storm of all of that coming together because, you know, it really is 
something that when you look at it from an unbiased perspective, you know, I think the conservation of 30% of land and water by 2030, I think any environmentalist, any um, conservationist, any hunter, any angler, Spiro, like we all want to see healthy habitats, mm. um, biodiversity, sustainable fish populations, wildlife populations, like that's a no brainer. Um, mm. Where the the devil of the details, so to speak, is just, you know, um, does it equate to a loss of access? And, yeah. and that's, that's where there's a lot of fear and some misinformation and some fears may be grounded in, in past, uh, grievances and, and, and some yeah. very rightly so. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're trying to, like I said, just walk that, um, that narrow path of, of understanding that this is a, this is, this could be a real benefit to, to hunters and anglers, but it could also, you know, if, if it takes the wrong turn, it could, it could equate to a loss of access. And, and so we're, you know, we're trying to engage sportsmen and women to, to just be a part of that process, to make sure that their voice is heard and to echo the importance of this, this conservation yeah. work, but, yep. but highlighting the successes that, um, we have already established and we've already demonstrated to, to, you know, the species and the demonstrated success um, and, and try to point to those during this, um, you know, for this like laudable campaign campaign of 30 by 32, um, to say like this, this is what we're advocating for. This is what we know works and, and sportsmen and women can have a part of that. And, and we don't, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be shutting off access at the same time. Sometimes I think, you know, consultation is a great word, but it's a little bit like sustainable and the fact that it's trendy and people like to throw it around, but the actual mechanics of a, f a fully consultative process are quite difficult and it requires goodwill from everyone. It requires active involvement and engagement and a lot of time and energy go into it. And then if you do have things that cloud that and ideologies come into it, I can see how it um, becomes pretty messy. Here on the east coast of Australia, down in New South Wales, they tried to bring in an initiative where they did something similar. Unfortunately, all of the habitat that they tried to turn into reserves were pretty much 95% of shore-based spearfishing activities in that particular part of the world. And uh, like you, you were, you were that what what that what they were proposing would actually completely ruin um, land-based spearfishing practices and it would mean families would no longer be able to do what they had done for a couple of generations. And, uh, and I think when we become removed away from hunting and catching stuff for ourselves, I think it actually has a, the opposite effect of what these people are, in t uh, you know, are trying to do. Um, do you guys see something similar happening there with the 3030 initiative? Is, it, is this uh, sort of some of the conversations that you have around it? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a couple of points I can make on that one. Um, 30 by 30 and, and, um, the Marine protected area network sometimes are either conflated or there there's just like this, you know, intermixing of the two. And, you know, what we have in California right now, beyond all of the different regulatory bodies, which, um, <laughs> you know, manage and regulate fish and wildlife, which is, you know, that's, we have the regulatory process established by the Magnuson Stevens fishery conservation and management act. We have the Pacific fisheries management council. Um, we have NOAA fisheries, the department of fish and wildlife, the fishing game commission. And then we've got laws, the fishing game code, and all these different agencies dedicated to managing our wildlife resources. Um, you know, and especially, you know, the marine resources, but, um, on top, of which, you know, are pretty new, many of them, and, uh, a good number of them are, you know, do heavily restrict fishing, um, or, or, you know, completely, uh, ban it. And so, you know, what, what's happening with 30 by 30 is there's a number of groups that are, that are kind of pushing for fully or highly protected marine protected areas along 30% of California's coast. Right now there's 16% of the coast are, are MPAs. And, and some of those MPAs are really great models of conservation access opportunity. I mean, some like you point to like a state marine conservation area where, you know, you're, you're allowed to spearfish, you're allowed to, you know, recreational take a fin fish through hook and line. You can dive for lobsters and urchins. And there's a few 
maybe a few extra things that, that would be left out that you might be wanting, but it's a pretty good balance. Um, and then there's others where you can only take, uh, you know, bait fish basically by hook, hook and line. There's no spear fishing allowed. Um, and others where there's just zero fishing at all. And so there's a really broad spectrum within those MPAs and, you know, in those no fishing areas, um, I'll preface all this by, I'm not a biologist. And so I, I, I won't, I don't purport to be one and I'm not an oceans expert. I just try to understand as much as I can and, and find that balance between some of the, the difficult tasks and conversations. But I think important to, to note are one, as you were talking about the impact to, you know, the recreational angler who's accessing along the coast, the spearfishing access, um, that's a big part of this. And, and I think, you know, there's, there's arguments to be made for disadvantaged communities and, and a whole, a whole gamut of, of kind of some unintended consequences maybe of these MPAs, but also, uh, important to note are the, is the lack of data that's gathered for nearshore fish species, especially, mm. um, you know, there, there's a number of species that don't have a prescribed, uh, fishery. They're just, you know, data is just collected through, uh, exclusively angling. Um, mm. and so, you know, in the areas where angling is now disallowed, you, that data set is gone. Yep. Uh, that's going to yep. require funding. This is one thing we've seen here in Australia too. And I can, I can only speak from my poor knowledge of what happened down south but uh, basically a lot of the competitions that they ran the social competitions down in new south wales um the governing body for spearfishing down there would collect the data and they were annually going to the same areas and so they were able to show historic levels of catch with specific species and weights and all the rest of it year in year out which gave fisheries a really valuable data set and i think you know, we, this is the beauty of trying to do things properly. I think if you can involve anglers and spiros in this com these conversations, you actually can get end up with a more robust data set and then everyone wins. Um, however, I don't know, it's just hard to get everyone to stand up and get involved, I guess. So how, how, how are you guys helping to get spiros involved with this process and how can people in every part of the world become part of these processes and uh, what's your message to the average spiro? Yeah. I mean, that's the million dollar question. Um, and that's something that we're continually seeking. We're having that conversation with the state agencies and uh, the regulatory bodies and the groups that are ha making these decisions. I mean, part of it comes down to just providing anecdotal comment during these uh, listening sessions and, and, you know, public agencies are pretty good about taking public comment now. And so, I, you know, in California specifically, when we're talking about 30 by 30 or whatever it might be, um, I, you know, hunters, anglers, spiros, we're outnumbered 10 to one on the regular. Um, and that's because, I mean, when you look at the percentage of hunters in California, it's less than 1%. So, um, wow. 10 to one, that's not bad. We're, 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 you know, basically 10 times what our percentage would be respective to the population and, um, angling, there's a little bit greater percentage, but we're still, you know, far, far outnumbered. And, and that's not to say that it's 99% against one, but it, you know, many of the people that are not engaged in those activities don't have that same understanding. They don't realize that, um, folks are doing this for food. They're doing it for recreation, but it's also just, you know, a way of life. And it's, uh, it's something that it is a tradition and it is important for families. And so, you know, um, I would say just anecdotal comment is great. Um, but also, you know, I think trying to get, involved beyond that superficial understanding. And, you know, I'm not going to shoot, now, obviously, you know, follow the laws, follow the regulations. Um, they're there for a reason. They're there to protect fisheries. So, uh, you know, obviously pay attention to all that stuff, but even beyond that, I think try to understand, you know, a little bit more about that whole ecosystem can and try to become more educated and understand, you know, why are, why is a calico bass size restriction 14 inches? And, you know, what are the growth rate charts for some of these different fish? And, uh, you know, like a yellow tail is going to be mature in their second year, but a halibut's going to take, you know, four or five years, uh, uh, or actually I me, mean, I think the, the females, but males are like three years, but you know, the fish have all sorts of different maturing levels and growth rate charts. And, and yeah. there's just a whole ecosystem down there beyond what you're 
you're, what you're trying to shoot and, and maybe some of those more popular fish that you are going after, you know, there's a whole lot else out there that, that are sort of those periphery fish that, that are very abundant and that are not the absolute prized fish, but you'd be amazed when you start to really break things down in the kitchen and you really get into it and you look at food as this whole new way to kind of interact with just like being healthy and living, uh, you can make a lot of stuff taste really good. And so I just encourage folks to, to explore those different fish, maybe that, that don't get as much love. Yeah. And then the last thing I'll say real quick is just citizen science. Like there's really a lot of opportunities for being engaged for, you know, obviously participate in those angler surveys when you can, but, mm. um, you know, there's also really cool iNaturalist campaigns, um, in different areas that are looking to track particular species, or maybe it's sea star wasting, or maybe it's urchin barrens. And, um, you know, these are opportunities for you to, you're out there, you're on the, you know, you're in the water, you're in the, the environment and, and there's no one who's more better equipped to provide that data set to the departments that are managing these wildlife resources than, um, spiros and anglers and hunters. And so I would just say, get involved in the citizen science as much as possible. I, yeah, just to, it. just to clarify or add on to that a little bit, Devin, I'm putting myself in the shoes of someone that would have no idea how to get involved. Um, I think a lot of the clubs here are so focused on let's go out and have fun and maybe do a competition or two internally. And, and they might not even have somebody that's very conservationally minded or kind of aware of those issues or those, the seasonality of the fish or the maturity numbers. So my advice would be for people to find someone that does take that into mind. And even someone like me, who's pretty well involved in the community over here in the West coast. Now, I don't know of a whole lot of people that really do put it out there. Like, Hey, make sure you join this meeting on this date. You know, there's a small handful of us that are doing that. So if you're, if you're really interested in getting involved, I'd say BHA is a good place to start. Um, there's other resources, there's other people, but you, you gotta at least be in the know of the people that are in the know. Yeah. Yeah. iNaturalist.org um, that Devin mentioned is a good um, resource as well for finding some of these citizen projects. Um, I've, I've had a chat with a few people about it before as well. I think that's a good way. Like it's good to be in actively involved in some of these projects. And, um, you know, every time you get to engage with people that are not actually involved in the hunting and spearfishing slash fishing lifestyle, like I said, it's a, it's an opportunity to have conversations, you know? And, um, yeah, so awesome. Love it. Um, there's so much people are not aware of, you know, um, and, and we're all learning all the time. I think even marine biologists um, find out stuff every day, you know, that they don't know and didn't know about the natural world. Like it's a, it's a crazy place, the ocean, and there's so much to learn. I think being the benefit of, you know, having the benefit of being a Spiro, like you spend so much time in the water, you can't help but notice stuff. It's good when you can pair it up with some, um, some formal learning as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I'll just say for, for uh, any of the California folks, you know, like if you are really interested in MPAs, there are MPA collaboratives uh, all up and down the coast. And, you know, this, this is not like a exclusive society necessarily. And, you know, I, I would recommend trying to figure out where your local collaborative is, be involved because, you know, it, it's just, it's really easy to check out and say, well, you know, there goes another place that uh, there's a lot of places that I spearfish as a kid that are now MPAs. And like, part of me is like, man, uh, you know, that's a, that's a tough pull to swallow. And it's easy. It's easy. You know, MPAs where you can't go, you can't fish nothing. And so, um, I won't comment on, on whether or not that's beneficial to the ecosystem as, cause I'm not a biologist, but it does, you know, it does, it's easy to just say like, oh man, you know, we're going to lose it all. And there's nothing you can do, but, um, I, you gotta be involved. Like you gotta be a part of that conversation, um, at the end of the day. Great news, guys. Adam Stern has made his freedivingfamily.com courses available at a discount for the new Spiro community. If you get on freedivingfamily.com, use the code Spiro, you'll get 20% off any course. There's a bunch of sick courses on there. There's an equalizing uh, stage one. There's an equalizing advanced techniques um, video there. They're two of my absolute favorites. If you have any problems with equalizing, go to freedivingfamily.com. Get Adam's course and use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. I just love a functional and simple spear gun. 
that I can trust when I pull the trigger. Kill Shot Spear Guns utilize the finest of kiln dried Burmese tea. Kill Shot Spear Guns also combine American made parts and fine craftsmanship to bring you accurate, reliable, and simple spear guns that you can trust fish after fish. Get $30 off any Kill Shot Spear Gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Uber. That's $30 off American made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com. I'm really sorry for this terrible accent. Brought to you by Ed Martin at killshotspearguns.com. In the world of freedive spearfishing, there's no magic breathing technique that's all of a sudden going to get you down and shoot massive fish at depth and holding big bottom times, but there is a way to do it safer and smarter and take down more fuel to maximize the time that you have there. Learn at noobspearer.com forward slash Ted with Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving. If you take down more fuel, you can stay for longer. Learning to take a bigger breath is not such a big deal. Ted breaks it down for you with a free online course, noobspirit.com forward slash Ted. Take down 20 to 30% more air just by learning how to take a full breath. Again, learn how to do it free at noobspirit.com forward slash Ted. Here off Brisbane, I can speak to, an, a, you know, when they made uh, the Moreton Bay uh, Marine Park or Marine Estate, um, Spiros, I don't think that we did have much of a say in it. And because of that, we don't have much at all. In fact, you know, some of the offshore, you know, to go spearfishing in Moreton Bay, like there's really limited opportunities. And uh, I didn't think we had much of an impact in there at all. And now we're not really allowed to go in there at all. And it's quite a large body of water and we've got to travel, you know, um, dozens of miles to get out beyond that in order to find places where we're actually allowed to go. So um, it pays to be part of the conversation for sure. Um Eric, before you mentioned uh, a really cool thing, and I think um, Devin's thoughts um, orient around this as well. We talked at the start about how, you know, as soon as he brought venison home to his mum, uh, it was a bit of a game changer for her mindset towards, you know, his pursuit of hunting. Um, same can be said of spearfishing. When you take a seafood meal home to people that have never experienced it, a wild-caught seafood meal, um, it can be a real mindset shifter. Um Speak to that. I think it ties in 100% with the Catch and Cook comp and um, some of the other initiatives we've had at No Spear as well. Well, I, I think I think sustainability, or at least like ocean mindfulness, like what we've been talking about, it can be very, very technical. It can be very data driven, and the data, as you heard, may be pretty limited. But if you just take into account, if you make it a personal ethic, something that applies to you, something that you don't try to force on everybody else, maybe you have conversations with other people about it. But if you make it an ethic to really get to know like the breeding patterns of certain species and and maybe not shoot the big ones when it's breeding season or something like that, just because, you know, it, it really could save 400,000 eggs you know, they can be born at that point. But I, I, if you just personally adopt uh, a mindset of becoming more educated on your environment, um, you'll, you'll quickly recognize that your progression as a spear fisherman will, will go, will go to food uh, or hopefully will go to food. Um, We talked a while ago, Shrek, about, you know, the stages of, of a spear fisherman and how it's kind of like a, Usually when you first start, it's you, you kill anything you can find. You just want to get that first fish because it's fun. And then it's like, I want to kill the most fish because now I'm getting good at this. And then it's, I want the biggest one so I can be the best. And, uh, and then after that, I think you kind of round the corner and you get into this place of like, well, I want to be mindful of what I'm taking. And, and then beyond that, I, I want to get active and, and actually start doing something to help the environment that we're in. And I think that might be one of the, the latter steps of your progression as a, as a hunter. But ultimately, somewhere along the line, after that, just get the biggest fish, uh, you're going to start really enjoying the food and, and wanting hopefully to get adventurous with the food. I mean, there's an adventure to diving deep and holding your breath, and it's scary with the waves. or the, you know, There's a lot of adrenaline and um and stuff that goes with it. But if you follow Finn and Forage, you know that we get really adventurous with food too. And I've personally almost found cooking with seafood to be more fun than gathering it at this point. Um, being in the ocean is a great relaxation and, and it's a, there's a lot of meditative process to it and a lot of, you know, being in tune with your body. But 
then you get to sit down and think about all the fun stuff you can do. And, and much like Devin's mom's reaction, if you have quality cared for seafood, you know, you, you shot it well, you dispatched it well, you bled it, you brained it, you kept it cold, you brought it home in the ice chest. Some people don't even know that a fish actually tastes better a few days after if it's been buried in ice and you know, that you're not getting guts or anything on the meat. Um, but yeah, fish, fish can actually taste better if properly cared for. And then you have a fish that tastes good for the first time. A lot of people don't like seafood because their experience with it has been, it's fishy, it's gross. And there's a, there's a quote out there that says, if you walk into a seafood restaurant and it smells like fish, don't eat there. Cause it shouldn't have that, that nasty old fish smell. Same with your, you know, you go into a, a grocery store and the eyes are all sucked in. The fish are old. They're clearly been there for a long time. And the fishmonger will tell you, if you're going to go to a fish market, the first thing you do is you, you poke the eyes to make sure they're bouncy and they're nice and glassy. And then you smell it. And if it doesn't smell fishy, then you're good. So yeah, I think, I think ultimately spearfishing comes down to the food and the process of, of harvesting wild food and all the different flavors that the sea has to offer because there's a lot more than fish out there that taste good. Mm, 100%, 100%. So, look, let's talk about Catch and Cook Comp. So I know you've partnered up with Devin with this initiative. Yeah. Um, walk us through sort of what's happening this year, when it's happening, where it's happening, sure. and how this sort of comp format has evolved well, the, the Fin and Forage is actually started by a catch and cook competition. We, uh, a few of the influential Spiros got together and said, hey, how can we kind of, you know, use our platforms to push, hope, hopefully push spearfishing and, you know, a, a little bit different of a direction. And we said, Food's, food makes the most sense. And so um, I, I said, instead of shoving our opinions down people's snorkels and arguing that, no, it has to be about the food, we just incentivize them to care about the food. And to, to some really high level judges, some, some professional executive chefs that would quit judges. And what was surprising, A, was how many people were on board that first year. And then B, was the competitors themselves had so much fun. Everybody was walking around and tasting each other's food. The family of the competitors came and they were out, you know, kayaking or we had a beach cleanup that we did that first year. And we, we really, I mean, we've had two years of shutdown where we couldn't have events and stuff. And, and we've had two years to think about changing the format. And seriously, it's like almost the exact same. There's, there's a few <laughs> minor tweaks. There's, there's a few additional incentives. You know, the urchin culling is a part of it. So if you don't want to compete, we actually, when we first put it out, there's 25 seats because, uh, for, the, for the cooking competitors. So those sold out in a day. Oh, wow. It's very surprising to me. And you can't have more than 25 because the judge, I mean, think about trying to eat 25 separate dishes. You're just going to explode at some point. So we, we uh, capped that we, at 25. You just need it. Look, you pay for my flights. I'll come and help out. Hey, if you come out, I will put you on the judge seat. I'll make another <laughs> table. Make the table <laughs> well, look, the other judges might have a taste. I'll be eating the whole dish. So the next judge <laughs> will get nothing. You'll have to put me on the end of the line. Oh, man. You, yeah, that's good. We wouldn't have a lot of fish. You're hired. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so it, since knowing that we only have 25 paid competitors for the cooking part, we said, how can we get the general public more involved? And so we, we have an open to the public beach cleanup where for every five gallon bucket of trash you bring back, you'll get a raffle ticket to a beach cleanup specific prize package. And holy cow. Okay. These prize packages this year blow the first years way out of the water. And the first years were incredible. We are currently at $20,000 worth of sponsored items and excursions and, and stuff like that, art pieces. Um, we've got in the, in the prize package for the beach cleanup, we've got a $1,000 gift certificate to a, a really nice spot down in Big Sur where you can either have like a, a dinner for eight or a breakfast for 12 or a three night stay with you and your buddies for a dive trip down there. And that's just wow, for wow. picking up trash off the beach. Plus you get your own trophy my mic for this podcast is is propped up on the box that this uh this trophy set from the rustic craftsman um came in today and it's a just a really really beautiful piece that any ocean lover doesn't have to be a diver is going to appreciate and so all of the open to the public event part like if you're a diver and you don't want to cook you can go out and get your your limit of urchin bring it all back and you get a bunch of raffle tickets to the urchin specific prize package which is i mean like huge very desirable stuff and 
we, it, it's been incredible the amount of people that have come along this year. But what I think is most exciting is seeing that we're really, I think, having a pretty big splash in the messaging. I, I think a lot more people, and thanks to you, thanks to 99 Recipes book and that whole initiative, and I, um, just the whole idea that I think a lot more people are on board with food more now. And so it's just, it's really fun to have put as much blood, sweat, and tears as we have into the project and have something like this to show for it. I've talked to, uh, I've talked to like four or five of the, you know, the really big name ex competitive Spiros that, you know, went to worlds all the time and stuff like that. And uh, I asked them, I said, Hey, you know, how does this rank with some of the biggest ones you've been to? And they're like, you're, you're up there. <laughs> so it's been, it's just been a really rewarding thing this year. Equalizing problems can be something that derail you. Not today, my friend. Go to freedivingfamily.com. Check out the, either the Friends or an Advanced Friends or video or the Mouthful and Deep Friends or Equalization course at freedivingfamily.com. You can use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course at freedivingfamily.com. These courses are put together by Adam Stern and a select team of, of, of legends and to help you overcome different issues and help you perform better. And some of them are extremely relevant for freedive spearing. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. Use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Shrek, my dude, you're killing it on the Noob Spiro podcast. Every guest you get on frosts on the spearing life and the actionable info is off the chain. Over here at Spearing Magazine HQ, it's the same, buddy. So many newers are submitting their adventures, lessons learned, and pictures here at spearingmagazine.com. Just wanted to say that uh, newers can get an international subscription here at spearingmagazine.com. They can also check out our In the Face apparel or getting a subscription to the world's greatest Spearing Magazine. Check it out at spearingmagazine.com. Shrek, thanks. Love what you're doing. Jeremy out. Awesome. With all the urchins you're collecting, um, I see like they're undergoing trials at the moment in Tasmania, which is sort of, you know, and it's off sort of the southern end of Australia. It's a, definitely a, a more uh, temperate part. But they have urchin bar barons there as well at times. And they're trialing using sea urchins and, and varieties of fertilizer for the garden, garden mm -hmm. and stuff. What are you guys doing with yours? 100%. So our, That's it. Our, yeah, that, that is. We have a farm, uh, a farmer again, it's called. A good buddy of mine runs a farm up, a, I don't know, 20 miles north of us. And I said, hey, we're going to have some fish waste and, and a bunch of urchins. Um, would you be open to turning it into fertilizer? And I think he's going to go the full fertilization route, not just blend it up and put it in the garden. But I think he's going to do, you know, add the chemicals, get it get it going and turn into a, a true fertilizer for his farm because it's a huge farm. So that's kind of I, I love that component it comes full circle. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, so much about, you know, I mean, we're talking about sustainability and lots of these feel-good initiatives. I think, like, soil enrichment's, you know, another huge part of it. I, I think, um, and Spiro's, like, a lot of Spiro's love making their own veggies and, you know, their own fruit trees and stuff. Like, a lot of us sort of have these ambitions of being almost self-sustainable in some ways. And I think, you know, like, urchins, if they, that, that we do have these big barons and you're allowed to collect them, they make great fertilizer. So it's just like a, it's a match made in heaven. I think, you know, it's funny is there, I think there is a drive for some people to like live off the grid and be self-sustainable. But for me, I have a huge garden here in Pacific Grove. Um, I, I knew very little about it going into it, but now it's a pretty, pretty good garden. We've got a lot of cool stuff growing. And for me, it, it's, it's not so much to live off the land. Although when the world shut down, it was nice to not have to worry and, you know, know we could go get the food, but, um, for me, I just like if you've had a quality tomato out of somebody's garden and then you go to the grocery store and buy a tomato, the it's two different products. The, the, oh, the grocery store is like watery and mushy and gross. And uh, and I find that's true for fish, seafood. I mean, just about any food, if you can collect it from the source or as close to the source as possible, your food is going to taste so much better. I have a hard time eating out at kind of like average restaurants now and i don't mean to sound like snooty i just mean i can taste i <laughs> well, can taste do. the flavors it's like i see the difference yeah yeah no nah, yeah i get it i get it and um you do your bar changes it shifts especially when you eat stuff growing around your own home i get it so all right getting back to the the catch and cook comp what are the dates and you you mentioned several events there are they all running on sequential days 
ha, was there a website they can register at? Yep. What's the cost? All that sort of stuff. There's no more cost. So if you're available, we've got um, so the the location is going to be near Del Monte Beach in Monterey, California. It's on April 30th. You can go to the Finn and Forage website and there'll be a pop-up for it. It'll take you to the page or you can go to finnandforage.com slash CNC22 for Catch and Cook 2022. Um, open to the public. There's there's no cost if you want to come. You can, you'll just have to sign a waiver if you want to dive for urchin or collect trash. And the more people, the merrier. I, I promise we have enough products and prizes. We've got raffles. We've got silent auctions. We've half dive gear, half restaurant gift certificates. I guess that math isn't going to work out. Half dive gear and then a mix <laughs> of gift certificates and places to stay, hotel stays, experiences like e-bike rental tours down in Big Sur and just lots of fun stuff. If you're not a diver, you know, your family can show up and win stuff um, and have a great time as well. Sounds super cool, Eric. I really love this initiative. Who are some of the legends that have helped you make this huge competition a reality? Oh, man, the team, the, the Finn and Forge team to start with. I, I've, I lean heavily on Ryan Gentry. Um, I lean heavily behind the scenes on a buddy named Matt Bond. He's, he's kind of the local foraging legend, so to speak. Yeah, and, uh, yeah I he's, think coming you know on the, he's, he's coming on the podcast, yeah, for sure. Nice. He's been a mess. He's, he's been a massive supporter, and he's a great voice in our community. He he really is. He's one of those guys that I was talking about earlier. Like, follow him on social media, and you'll know when and where to be to show up for this type of stuff. And you'll think he's the world's best cook uh, as well because he puts out he he gives us so many ideas. And um, he's going to be a judge this year too for the Catch and Cook, which is great. Um, and he call- he is Cut Professor on Instagram. Yeah, which cut is. Yeah, find him on there. He's a really interesting dude. Yeah, yeah, he does. Um, other big names, the, the BHA, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. Devin has given us access to all kinds of great sponsors. Traeger is going to be one of our sponsors because of them. That's a just a huge name. They've given us a couple really nice grills. Um, Messermeister, the high-end knife brand, is... Um, they're based in California, but they do German and Japanese style hand forged knives, and they're our presenting sponsor. We've got people like the club at Pasadera or Hitchfire, or you know, there's this we've got artists that do really high-end art. We've got all kinds of gun builders like Charlie Spears, the um, building us guns, Bubba Blades on board. That that one came through Valentin. Um, that was a great uh, a connection there. Awesome. Um, yeah, this it's there's there's it's not just a couple people that put this on. It's really I think it's really everybody that sees the value in this type of lifestyle that wants to be on board. And we're just happen to be the team that you know is willing to put in the effort to make it happen. Man, it sounds bloody awesome. Talking about Valentine, apparently you pooed on her or something. <laughs> 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 oh, she doesn't know this yet. So if, if someone's going to hear this and reach out to her and be like, so did Eric poop on you? Uh, the, the direct answer is I don't think so. But she came out and did uh, a project with a festival seafood, who's um, actually our cookbook sponsor for the, the event as well. We'll do a cookbook. Um, not to compete with 99 Spiro recipes, but. Uh, hey, the more the more the merrier. <laughs> you know what I'm like with this stuff, Eric. Um, so, so she flies out. It, she, she's got like two days of a dive window. We've got this epic videographer, Kyle Boothman, and um, and and it's really a make or break kind of a situation. And you always want to go to the hard to reach places for the more adventurous type of dive. But the swell was angry. We could not go dive in the good places. I feel bad because I took this this huge name in spearfishing to arguably the absolute least like worst dive spot in central California. It's where <laughs> every single new diver goes. It's super protected, but there's like very, very few fish there. And so we, we get her out in the water and it's like five foot visibility. So even Joe could hardly get good um, video of it. And at some point, I don't know if it was just nerves or stress or what, but my stomach started gurgling. And we're talking <laughs> water here is the same temperature most times of the year that it is in Alaska. It is cold, cold. 
and uh, like low 50s, could be high 40s. Um, mm, I don't know if it's just me, but if I got to go, it's like right now, no time. And so I just swam behind one of the kayaks and tried to kick the kayak away from her and drop trout and <laughs> did what I needed to do real quick and, you know, tried to fin it and mix it up and uh, and get away from it and <laughs> all that day. So who knows? Lucky you had the Central California visibility. So it was it was uh, inseparable from the water. <laughs> well, we got fish. <laughs> uh, Sorry, fellas. Internet's just terrible today, eh? Oh, it's okay. I, I was saying maybe that's a good thing that it cut off because now this story might not need to get go into the podcast. No, nah, the internet, the, it's 100% going in there. So, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Mom, I apologize uh, ahead of time. What's going to happen with this part of the interview, Eric, is where are you cut out? I'm just going to ad lib um, and just make, <laughs> up, make up the story on your behalf. I'll try and do your accent and everything. So, And then I... I I got over top of Valentine and just dropped trowel. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think it's those days where you have five foot visibility and you do an aqua bog that you're quite grateful for the poor vis because uh, the poo is inseparable from the color of the water. Oh yeah, yeah, you have no idea. We actually <laughs> got fish. We got fish after that, so I, you know, maybe she should thank me. Well, that's what, that was my question when you cut out there was you know. How did, how did the chum work? Did it bring them in or what? <laughs> Lucky you didn't have white sea bass coming on that sort of enticing, you know, aroma. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, no wonder there's urchin barons there. What are you, you, you guys talking about sustainability and then doing that? Eric, you got to hang your head, mate. I know. Hey, uh, you, there, there's a difference. It's like you go and stomp on ice plant on your way in, or you have like a, a bowel disruption that you're either going to just destroy your wetsuit or you're going to do what you got to do. Today's Noob Spirit podcast, Bowel Disruption, brought to you by Finn and Forage. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. I love it. Oh, man. Um, I think he's got. Nah, it's good stuff, guys. Um, massive apologies for the internet today and to the listeners as well who are um, battling through listening to the episode as well because of the internet problems we've experienced. So you're, thanks for, you're cutting out pretty bad, dude. Yeah. Apologies, guys. I'm trying to connect to my phone, guys, so just bear with me for two seconds. Do you like to penetrate? Great news. Penetrator Fins, today's Noob Spirit podcast sponsor are tough as nails. Robust, dependable performers with beyond industry standard warranty. Communicate direct with Larry and his team 24-7 for all your fin inquiries at penetratorfins.com or at penetratorfins on Instagram. Baby spum finish. These things are smooth as silk. They glide through the water. They give you that awesome balance between power and efficiency. This is Penetrator Fins. Use the code Anoopspiro to save $25 on any pair of Penetrator Fins at PenetratorFins.com. That's right, use the code Noobspiro to save $25 on any pair of Penetrator Fins at PenetratorFins.com. Kill fish with precision and power, sending shafts from a stable platform with Kill Shot Spear Guns. Made in the Florida Keys by Ed Martin, you're buying American-made dependable spear guns. Get $30 off any Kill Shot Spear Gun at Kill Shot Spear Guns. Dot com. Yes and amen, Nuba. That's $30 off American-made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com. It says if they're in the shop or on the phone, they can cash in by saying, Crikey, mate, or the Noob Spiro podcast sent me. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com, based in the Florida Keys. There we go. See if mobile hotspot works better. All right, cool. Let's see how we go from here. All right, cool. So what I got before our internet turned really bad, Eric, was that, you know, you obviously, you know, you, you pooped on Valentine. You showed her the worst spot in Central California and had an absolute disaster of the trip. Did you guys get what you wanted out of that apart from, um, you know, Oh man! apart from all that? It was, it was a successful adventure. I did. I got to still do the cliff jump that I really wanted to do or the cliff dive. There's a big pinnacle down in Big Sur the second day. The water wasn't so rough and I climbed up with my mask and uh, usually I take my mask off on a dive, but for some reason I was like 35 feet or so above the water and there's a tiny little hole that you you have to aim for and 
and and I jumped and the the goggles ripped off and snapped. But uh, we still got oh. the shot. The video came out great. I think you'll really <laughs> enjoy the messaging. The video will. Uh, the video should get launched by Pescavore probably this month. So keep oh, keep nice. your eye out for that. And we've got a nice kind of voiceover with yours truly. I wish I had more of a radio voice because uh, to me it sounds monotonous. But you know we're our own worst critic. So I'll try to comfort myself with that. 100%. Just do what I do when I have to listen to myself and just speed it up to 2.0. You're much more bearable, even if you're slightly chipmunk. <laughs> so, Devin, do you and Eric dive together at all? Not yet, man. Um, yeah, this, I mean, this is kind of like initially sort of forged somewhere right in the middle of the pandemic. And so um, I know Eric's got a a pretty young one at home. I've got a two-year-old. And so I've been, uh, I've stayed pretty close to home, but, uh, I'm, I'm super excited about being able to, to get out and dive with the Finn and Forge guys one day and they can put me to shame. I'm sure. Um, now that I've just kind of lost all my breath hold and become a, <laughs> you know, a, become a dad and just let myself go in, in two years, it's been a quick <laughs> decline, but, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I'm excited to do it. I mean, there's, I think just just in general, just have that time, you know, in the water, but also wherever it might be, you know, sharing a beer, sitting around a campfire, shooting the shit, uh, yeah. telling fish stories and, and whatnot. Um, I'm sure we'll have, plenty. you know, I don't know why I didn't mention this yet, but I actually think that is the most fun you can have with your spearfishing friends. Like you get yeah. the stories and the highs of like, Oh, you got that big fish. It was awesome. And you know, that's, a, yeah. that's like an emotional high. But when you're sitting there at the end of the day and you're exhausted and you're making this great meal and you're laughing and you're, it's just that, that is the lifestyle that's really more fulfilling than shooting a fish. It's, it's really enjoying the community you're with. And I, I think it brings everybody together. Like I could never have met Devin in my life or you, but if we all got together after a dive day and cooked, we're going to get to know each other so much more. And it's just going to be so much more fun. Like I would advocate for that being the goal. If you ever get into spearfishing, do it so you can be around a campfire camping and, and eating with new buddies. Yeah, nice. All right, guys, I have a special quote I wanted to uh, read out, and then I want your thoughts on it, and then we might head on out and uh, tell people more about where they can find out about this catch and cook comp and BHA. Ed Zern, you may have heard this quote, says, I don't regard nature as a spectator sport. Agree, disagree. Obviously, you guys agree with 100% biased. You want to take it first? Uh, yeah, um, I was going to ask you the same question, but since you beat me to it, I will take first crack. Um, I mean, stop me if I start going too far down this rabbit hole, but um, <laughs> I mean, nature nature will, will just eat you up and spit you out and not care. <laughs> it, you know, I mean, I think that's the first reaction I have to that is that... Uh, we're far too comfortable in our lives these days and, and all of our creature comforts and, um, all it takes is, you know, just a weekend doing what we were just talking about, uh, procuring your own food, cooking it, um, getting, getting into that remote place and getting out. They'll teach you a whole lot that you need to know about nature, about yourself, about surviving, um, the grind. And then I think just during that process, you start to have an appreciation for the wildlife and, uh, the grind that is their existence. Um, I think it gives you that just better understanding of wanting to be a part of the whole process to understand it a little better, to help to conserve it, you know, just to understand what your impact is because when you're, when you're there and you're procuring your own food and you're cooking it and you're, you're just kind of at that zero sum level of impact. Uh, I think that there's something that's comforting for me about that being engaged in nature in that way. And, uh, somehow, you know, sitting at home and getting your food from the grocery store and nothing wrong with it. But to me, it's just, it's that disconnection. It's like, what impact am I really having, you know, and, and where's my money going and how, what type of, uh, you know, distant impact is that having somewhere else on ecosystems or wildlife or whatever it may be, um, that I have no control over. And, um, to me, you know, just being a part of the equation, um, having that, that one-on-one -on -one connection with the food source is what it's all about. And, uh, if you're not paying attention, like I said, uh, nature's going to eat you up, spit you out, and it's not going to care any, any more about it. So, um, best to pay attention. 
<laughs> Love it. Eric? I don't think you can ever get anything other than an opinion from that quote. Uh, you're mm. going to have people that have emotional experiences or traumas that like to be out there because it forces you to be still and it forces your mind to slow down. You're going to have the adventurers that want to get out there and, and explore new things. Like from my point of view, what I love most about spearfishing and spearfishing specifically, it stands true for, you know, I used to do a lot of survival camping and stuff, but I love feeling like I belong in a place I don't belong. Like when you've got, you've got a strong surgy swell that's like smashing you into this cave because you're trying to get that scallop way at the back of it. You could either fight the water and, you know, you're trying to kick to the next hunting spot and the, the surge is going against you and you're trying to fight it and kick it, or you could just relax and let it take you. And then when it takes you back the other way, that's when you kick. And it's fun to just kind of like, you're in this other world place with all this kelp and all these creatures and and uh you know crackling and kind of claustrophobic and uh and then the water's pushing you around and you can either fight it or you can just learn to interact with it and i think that's that's personally my favorite part of getting into nature you can't just sit there and watch it you can't just sit there and regard it you have to participate and you can either do it in a way that's beneficial or you can do it in a way that's exhausting but yeah like devin said one way or the other you're going to get chewed up <laughs> Uh, I love it, guys. If you're listening, guys, and you're interested in this catch and cook comp, you can go to Fin and Forage, and it is happening at the end of April in 2022. If you're listening to this episode much, much later, as as people do, then go to Fin and Forage and check out what they're doing the next year, because I'm sure this is about to become an annual event, barring COVID 2.0, um, dare I say it. Um, and also... Obviously, check out Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, um, where Devin works for these, the, the California director. But, um, gentlemen, where can any listener come and connect with uh, either or both of you? Um, we'll start with Eric. Uh, usually, social media uh, is the easiest spot. At Fin and Forage is, is the best place. All right, cool. And Devin? Yeah, um, for BHA, for myself, um, I, you know, Instagram is always a good way. You can, you can stay in, in the know and, and get in touch with us backcountry hunters CA. Um, and I'd also recommend following the, you know, backcountry hunters, um, the main, the main account that's, you know, North America wide. And then you can shoot me, you can always email us to just California at backcountry or, um, I'm, I'm the same way. It's funny. I don't, I just kind of lost that drive on the personal Instagram. Um, but I, uh, I'm chef boy OD. So you can, um, you can try to find me there, but don't, cause there's not much happening. So don't hold your breath. I found you, man. I found you. I, I seen the lobster on the, on the can of Dos ah. Was that, I think that's how you say it or yeah. Dos Aquis, is it? I don't know, but, uh, it looks like a, a nice drop and, uh, those California spiny lobsters are, uh, pretty cool. And for anybody that is interested in just the format and kind of the more structure of the catch and cook, they're not that hard to organize. You know, I feel like we've put in the work to figure out how to organize them. So if you're interested in doing it in your own area, um, hit me up. I'd love to help you make it successful. Um, and we're going to do a big video recap of the competition as well. So make sure you're checking us out on YouTube. Not, I'm not trying to like promote subscribers or anything. I just mean like if you're interested, we're going to put a video out. So you're welcome to come check it out. Eric, you're not going to promote it, but I will. You've got to go over to Fin and Forage on YouTube. Subscribe to that channel. They've got some banging stuff. If nothing else, go there and just have a look and, and, and immerse yourself in the experience of diving through those beautiful kelp forests that you guys have got over there. Um, it's a special thing, and um, I love some of the cinematography that you guys get hold of. And um, always, like, our, you know, they're quite sort of um, purpose-driven videos as well, so it's a, it's a great channel to subscribe to. That's awesome. Smash that like button. <laughs> Smash that like button, guys. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> love that. Um, all good. Devin, uh, Eric, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've had a ball today. Um, we chatted 30-30. We've chatted the Catch and Cook comp coming up, and we've had a good old chat just about the spearfishing hunting lifestyle that we all love and enjoy. And uh, I hope people have enjoyed the episode today. You're awesome. Thanks again. Cheers, Eric. Thanks for having me, man. Hey 
Hey guys, I hope you got through today's interview all right. Um, the audio guys, as usual, do a bang up job. Thanks in particular to Brandon for editing this episode. I know that uh, some of the internet was pretty crummy while we were chatting away and we had to pause and start this conversation several times. But in saying that, I felt like uh, Devin and Eric were both uh, very good conversationalists around some fairly controversial and difficult issues and uh, we got through it. So I hope you enjoyed the show. As usual, if you love the podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash Noob Sparrow. I'd love it if you joined the 52 other legends there helping to, helping to keep fuel in the Noob Sparrow outboard, helping to keep this show going. I really appreciate it. As usual, guys, wherever you leave love for the show, really appreciate it. And uh, hey, while we're here, 99 Sparrow Recipes is going really well. By the end of April, we will have a very near ready version of the book and hopefully the beta readers will be coming on board back into the month. We should be making this special thing happen. I'm really looking forward to shipping this book out. If you're not aware of what 99 Spare Recipes is, it was a a, a crowdfunded and crowdsourced recipe book for the spearfishing community designed to help us make make us all a bit better in the kitchen, a bit more intentional towards our seafood and help us to use more of the fish. And uh, jeepers, it's, it's coming along really well. Super excited about launching this thing later. So hopefully it'll be up and available for everyone later in the year. But uh, at first, I'm going to get all the rewards out to the Kickstarter backers and the people that help make this project a reality. So anyway, see you back in two weeks' time. I don't even know what the next episode is going to be, but I'm sure it'll be a banger. All right, catch you guys. The Noob Sphere Podcast is incredibly proud to be partnering with Neptonics.com. It's solid gear that works, equipment you can rely on. It's the very best in spearing gear from around the planet. Neptonics is also the one-stop shop for all your spearfishing gear, particularly in the US. They've got free shipping on all orders over $99 in the US. Furthermore, you can use the code NOOB10 to save 10% off on your entire shopping basket at Neptonics.com. Use the code NOOBSPEAR at Neptonics.com. Today's episode was an absolute banger, and so is our major sponsor, Adreno. Visit them at adreno.com.au. They have a huge range of equipment, and you can find it at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear at checkout. When you shop online, you can save $20 on every purchase over $200. You can even use that code in-store at some of their huge mega stores Australia-wide. Price be guarantee on any Australian spearfishing equipment price. Again, visit them at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear. Thank you.